Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, listeners. Thanks for joining us again. Today, I have two guests, a past guest that you well, all well know, Donna Marenti. And she brought along her friend, Angela Burrow, and we are discussing on forgetting what's lost and focusing on what remains. So thank you for joining me, ladies. Thank Thank you. you. You're welcome. So let's start with Donna, because that's where we were starting when we were before we were recording. We were talking a little bit about habilitative care. Can you explain what that is and maybe how that relates to the topic of focusing on on their the skills that they're remaining. Boy, my tongue decided to tie itself in a knot. <laughs> sure, sure, absolutely. So, habilitative um, dementia care is very much focused on what can we still do. Um, you know, it's no secret that um, as whatever the underlying disease process is, whether it's Lewy body dementia or Alzheimer's dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia. There's over 120 different kinds of dementia, and they're all coming from some underlying um, disease process. They affect the brain in different ways. And so not everyone with a quote unquote diagnosis of dementia, you know, it's kind of a catch all phrase. Um, is going to experience the same um, maybe cognitive challenges or have the same strengths remaining. I think that up until very, very recently, a whole lot of the stress on caregivers, whether they're home caregivers or caregivers, you know, in a congregate care setting has been that, you know, we tend to focus on what we see what they call me. Angela and I have have issues with some of the uh, terminology here. So um, for the sake of everyone, uh, it's not a dirty word, I'll say it, behaviors, um, which are actually reactions to unmet needs. But, uh, you know, up until very recently, when this habilitative model has started to take root, we've tended to focus on the behaviors and you know, okay, they're trying to get out the door. That's what they're doing. Why are they doing that? And when you start to drill down and say, okay, why are they doing that? There's an underlying need there. Are they bored? Um, Are they frustrated? So then we need to look at, okay, you know, they, maybe they have some memory issues. Maybe they have some issues with speech, but there's there's a whole lot left. You know, we've got four <laughs> lobes going on in that coconut of ours and only maybe one is affected. So how can we use the rest for other strengths? Um, I will uh, quote, Tipa Snow was on your podcast uh, a couple of weeks ago, a month or so ago. Uh, and January I 3rd, 4th. Yeah, I listened into that. And so I will give full credit to Tipa for this, um, what I'm about to say as far as focus on the cake of the donut, not the hole in the middle. So, you know, someone goes to the doctor, maybe they've been experiencing some, some balance issues, some vision issues, word finding, whatever prompts them to go to the doctor. And, you know, let's say grandma, the morning of the appointment was busy making uh, at her sewing machine, making Halloween costumes for the grandkids. And they go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, you know, looks like, gee, this could be the beginning of uh, dementia. Okay, next thing you know, you know, the daughter's on the phone from the parking lot, the doctor's office there to put away the sewing machine, make sure there's no pins around. She has (laughs) dementia from day one. It's like you don't have to stop at the fabric store and buy muslin to mummy wrap them. (laughs) You know, the changes, here's the thing, the changes with really any kind of dementia come on slowly. You may see a person go through a period where they'll, they'll be level, they'll plateau, and then maybe they'll do that little bump. I call it the air turbulence bump. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's a good and, term. You know, you might kind of see almost overnight, well, they were able to do that yesterday, but not today. But for the most part, okay, the changes that come on with dementia come on slowly. The gap in that, you know, what's, what we're not reconciling is that we tend to impose changes sooner than we need to, faster than we need to. And after a while, it's not so much the disease process that may be inclining a person to be frustrated or, or act, I'll say it, act out, <laughs> but what we're trying to make them do. We're trying to pigeonhole them because this is, you know, trust me, it's great to be right on top of, you know, read up on things and, and listen to lectures and research. But sometimes the Internet is not your friend. And <laughs> so true. what happens is, you know, you can have somebody say, oh, my mother-in-law had Alzheimer's. Don't let them do this. Don't let them do that. And so we're missing out on the person that's very much still there focus on what they can still do because when their capabilities are still at 90 percent but we're mummy wrapping them no you can't do this anymore you can't do that anymore well, we can't take her here we can't take her there and those you know restrictions your capabilities are at 90 percent and the restrictions are at 110 percent there's no balance there's no balance. And what, what do we do when we feel we're losing our balance? We start you know, threshing our arms a little bit and saying, wait a minute, this isn't right. So, you know, more about habilitative uh, dementia care and actually um, Montessori uh, model of dementia care. Um, Dr. Cameron Camp, boy, he would be a great one to have on your podcast, Jen. Um, he developed uh, a system, a platform of Habilitative dementia care based on Montessori principles. Um, there's more about it at his website. It's sen4r.com, C E N, Charlie, Eddie, Nancy, number four, um, A R D, Annie, Ralph, Donna.com. Um, you know, his whole platform is they can still peel a carrot. And the caregiver says, Oh, what happens if they cut their finger? What happens if they nick themselves? What would happen? What would happen if I nicked myself peeling a carrot tonight? I'd go put a Band-Aid on it and go back to making dinner. You see a lot of times in in um, in congregate care settings, especially only electric razors. No, you know, the gentleman may be perfectly capable of still shaving, doing that morning shave on his own, that sense of pride, sense of accomplishment, you know, self-esteem. No. Nope. No, well, well, okay, well, why can't they use a safety razor? Isn't there a reason they call it a safety razor? Well, because they have dementia and they might cut themselves. And Donna, can I um, just, um, I'm sure you're leading up to this, but I want to be sure um, the light bulb, mo light bulb moments that Cameron Camp gives us, and he talks about learned helplessness, which is exactly what you've been describing. And what I like is, yeah, if they're peeling the carrots, make sure they're fine and then walk away. You know, like we have helicopter parents walk away and then you're giving them confidence. So that resonated with me, um, the learned helplessness. And he was the one, I think, also who helped me. It might have been Teeper as well. Talked about repetition. So that's in the list of 10 horrible, challenging behaviors, you know, that we have to. But repetition is just messaging. The repetition is just making sure you understand what they're trying to say. Whether yes, validating, validating. And, you know, that that's very important as well, that um, the best caregivers are the ones who are there, but you don't see them. They're there to offer assistance when needed. Um, my latest <laughs> crusade uh, is that, you know, we call it person-centered care. We have, well, actually, there are seven, I believe, um, written ex diagnoses for dementia, seven levels of dementia. But, you know, for the sake of ease, we'll say three levels, mild, moderate, advanced dementia. So we've got three levels there. 
And the three basically stages of Alzheimer's, same, mild, moderate, last stage. But we've only got one word, care. And not everybody needs care. That first stage, you know, probably a post-it note on the refrigerator, um, you know, maybe someone to just maybe give you a call in the morning and say, hey, don't forget our golf game this afternoon, because yes, they can still play golf. You know, they're not going to pick up the club and use it to beat the caddy. Um, <laughs> these are things that Angela and I hear, these horrible stereotypes that, that people just, where they come from, I don't know. But so in that first, very first stage, you know, maybe someone for um, get your paperwork together. Everybody should do that. You shouldn't have to have dementia to be 70 years old. Get your paperwork <laughs> together, um, said do she. It, do it before you're 70. We did ours oh, yeah. in 2020. So, so I was 54, I think. I can't do math. <laughs> so I have a question, you're... though. Yeah. Um, so I know many caregivers who subscribe to what we're discussing mm -hmm. they're very i don't want to well, i guess adamant is an okay word about maintaining independence and maintaining their loved one's ability to do all whatever they can do mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden there's a shift and these shifts always seem to happen overnight suddenly and the next thing you know i i'm kind of at i'm at a point where i'm relating it to a race where it's like You've been racing Alzheimer's all these years and you've been keeping up, but Alzheimer's just passed you. And now they're scrambling and they're, you know, it, and they're all, they're almost in a panic. They're stressed for sure, because now all of a sudden what they could do two weeks ago, they cannot do it all today. So how do we balance, you know, letting them do everything and not getting caught with our pants down for lack well, of a better term. <laughs> I would say, and you know, I'm sure Angela will have some tips on this as well, but I would say observe and anticipate. Um, you know, if it is a non-reversible type dementia, and you know, the reason I say non-reversible, I don't want to give people the impression that, oh, well, some of them can be reversed. But I mean, if you just think of the word dementia, it's reduced mental status, reduced. When you're drunk, you're demented. OK, <laughs> the disease process that we're thinking about is non-reversible. So it, it, it's OK to come to grips with the fact that like any other terminal disease that there is no treatment or cure for. Uh, well, there is treatment. It just doesn't come in a pill. But that there, any other terminal disease that there is no cure for, you know, again, people observe and anticipate and have your plans in place for when it happens rather than, oh, this is going to happen three years from now. So we better get started on it right now. That's where we shift from habilitative. You can still do this to helicopter caregivers. We mummy wrap them and. We create more functional disability by the time they hit that second and third stage, probably than the disease process itself would have. So rather than rush in for the siege, um, set up a little perimeter, kind of just, you know, observe. And, and I respect the concerns. Well, OK, so they can still go for a walk. Well, what happens that one time when they, they do get lost? OK, again, observe. Can you, someone in your family, a friend, a neighbor, go for a, go for that walk with them around the neighborhood. But you hang back. We don't always need to be the leader of the band. You hang back a little bit. And when they get to that street corner where you go left to get home again or you go right to end up from, you know, Michigan and end up in Cleveland, do they seem you know, baffled. Um, do they know their routine? Or maybe would they say, hey, I know this is the way home, but I want to pick up some donuts. Let's go this way. Observe. And when you do start to see those changes, don't please don't try and take the walk away from them. Um, and, and just real quick, I'll give you another example, because I know that, you know, there are situations where that we do have to deal with that are kind of universally 
unpleasant. Someone had asked the question about car keys. Um, you know, it, it just becomes that battle about getting car keys away from someone who really cannot, should not be driving anymore. Um, and, and it causes anger and frustration. I, I'm not saying this is going to work 100% of the time, but people with or without dementia, again, dementia needs are human needs, have a need to feel purposeful and part of society and a need to feel they're doing something good. So maybe rather than approach it from you can't drive anymore, you're going to kill yourself, blah, 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 and turn it we just turned it into a negative. You know, we shouldn't lie to people, but is there maybe a grandchild in the family that just got their license that could really use the car? Um, donate the car to, you know, some charitable organization that's going to do good things with those funds and, and explain it that way, that, you know, rather than you can't do this anymore, which is terribly demeaning you know, shape it and not in a false sense, but, you know, do a little thought puzzling here. Well, how can we make this be a positive experience for them? Okay. Well now, you know, you don't drive that much dad. And you know, it's, I'll take you where you need to go. I need to get out of the house more. I'd be, I would welcome, you know, taking a ride to the grocery store. How about rather than have that car sit out there, Let's donate it to, you know, some to the Boy Scouts or you know, to the church or something like that. They could really use it, you know, and, and maybe have a third party, have the pastor from the church come and talk about it with them. So when we do have to initiate those difficult changes, because we are at the end of the day, our brains are fully functioning and theirs might not be. So we are tasked with those difficult decisions. Um, but rather than just turn it into this push, pull, tug of war, it, battle, you know, be creative. Don't lie, but find situations where you can turn it into at least a feeling of self, self-esteem, self self-respect. I did something good. Well, I don't drive anymore, but the, the church needed it. Yeah, a couple of things on that, and I think that's wonderful, Um there is a, an organization, um, one of the geriatric care managers, there's a program that families might want to use, and it's called Driving with Dignity, and it just passes the buck. It passes someone else, and they can prepare people, and it may be somebody that's just got MCI. So that's useful. Pass it on the burden to somebody else so there's no confrontation. And then I would say as well, and I know a particular family member recently she started with a little notebook she got from the dollar store. She just made notes. What's a good day? What's a bad day? Suggest this. So when she did actually bring someone in, a companion with one of the big name home care agencies, she could share that information. So things were just a little smoother. And she said, you know, things are changing rapidly. So it's important that I share this. Um, so you cut problems off at the pass, I suppose. But are you familiar with Michael Ellenbogen? Do you know him? He's a gentleman. I'm not sure how old he is, but he was diagnosed um, at age 39. If you Google him, Michael Ellenbogen, he's on all kinds of wonderful podcasts and he likes to talk, I've noticed, with young gerontologists. So he's leave, I think he's thinking of legacy and teaching us. Um, and he just, um, one of the things that you'd said, um, Donna, he said he wants his life to have purpose. Mm -hmm. He wants to build memories. He's not got much time left for his wife and ha have good memories. And then he said, and you know, this purpose, what's important to me is that people are listening to me. So that goes back to the repetition. There'll come a stage <clears throat> where he won't have control. Now he does. So I think that's a good tip for us all because um, he'll come on podcasts. He's, sp he's spoken to CEOs and presidents of companies. That's keeping him going. So mm -hmm. I think People need to yeah. know We do. And, and so I guess, Jennifer, to summarize an answer to the question of they tried to let them be independent, what happens? You know, as make the changes in the increments that you see the changes and be prepared to have to make those changes when the time comes. Um, and, you know, let's say they're a chef 
And, you know, Aunt Tessie made Sunday dinner every week for, for your whole life. And maybe now, you know, she might have some issues going on with that um, um, occipital lobe uh, where vision is processed, spatial deficiencies and so forth. Well, is it a good idea for her to be lifting that big, heavy boiling water pot now? And, you know, it, assuming she's progressed. So maybe, you know, again, rather than you can't do that anymore. Oh, no, no, don't do that. No, you know. Oh, hey, I can get that. You know how much I hate washing lettuce. You know how much I, I just don't like setting the table. Would you do that for me? And I'll just I'll just strain these. You know, you would really be helping me do that. Another Cameron Camp tip. Not can you do this? Would you do this? Can you is a challenge. Would you is a choice. Just like the word no is a choice, not a behavior. So <laughs> you know, we have to remember that sometimes that you know the we somebody may say you know oh you can't do that like oh, I I have lost a tremendous amount of weight in the last decade and I work very hard on maintaining balance and muscle strength because it's important as we age. And, you know, you look better in your jeans when you do. So, you know, and you burn more calories when you have more muscle. So, you know, a lot of good reasons to do it. And when I had my photography studio, there were a lot of bulky, heavy, awkward things to move around. And it used to drive me bananas when generally the male client would say, oh, no, 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 let me help you with that. Because it'd be like, first off, I'm working for you. So I don't really want you hauling you know, stuff around. <laughs> and I really work hard at being strong, but it's like I had to remember, they're just trying to be helpful. You know, they're not trying to demean my, you know, I'm only five foot two. So, you know, when I'm carrying something that's taller than me, you know, they're just trying to be helpful. So I think sometimes when we try to help too much, you know, we, we put people's defenses up. Oh, you can't do that. I'll show you. And then we end up hurting ourselves because, you know, our ego gets the best of us. And I'm sure that's this case. You know, my yeah. mom never thought she could all the way up into the end. She didn't think she needed help, which caused a lot of problems. And it was, it was difficult because the more help she needed, the less she'd accept. And so it was very hard to find a balance that made her, more willing. So was, yeah, yeah. And you know, Jen, you hit on on the kind of the key to it. You know, people say to understand how a person with dementia feels, put yourself in their place. And that's a good start. <clears throat> but that's only going to get you 80, 90 percent there because at the end of the day, we don't have dementia. So my suggestion is take the dementia out of it. How would you feel without dementia? in that situation if there was something that you love to do all right maybe you love doing um, puzzles okay but you broke your foot and somebody says oh you can't do puzzles anymore you have a broken foot that makes no sense okay <laughs> it's you can compare that to oh you're in the first very mild stages of dementia um, but no, you can't, you know, shampoo your own hair or get yourself dressed anymore. It just has to be, how would we feel if people were, you know, putting us in situations that made no sense to them? And what you're describing that, you know, your mom, even in the late stages, a lot of people are not fully cognizant of the fact that, you know, there are some encroaching deficit. So we just have to be creative with it. Not again, not saying lie to them or sneak around, but that I'm convinced there's always a positive side to everything. It just sometimes takes longer to find that side. Angela, you agree with all that? I do. I definitely do. And I think I think of Michael that I talked about, but there's another lady from England. I've got a book right now in the mail from her. She wrote a book. Her name is Wendy Mitchell. And she said, what I wish people knew about dementia. So she, we've got to protect those people in the earlier stages. We want confidence in us as they move. 
into the mid stages and then later on. So I'm definitely going to share uh, the feedback um, with you on that. But it's like what I wish people knew. And then I was meant to say something that Donna said uh, reminded me there's a young man, which I think is great because I definitely want the younger generation to be empathetic. And he um, is from Holland and his name is Alexander Denhasia. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. Very young motivational speaker. And he absolutely describes um, our approach. And he says, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows, not the flower. So that's us. We've got to fix us. So a really um, insightful thing to say. I thought that was wonderful. I think I know who you mean. He is quite young. And I saw one of his posts once and it absolutely blew me away, you know, but that that's an excellent point, Angela. Um, we need to fix the environment, you know, and, and people and rightfully so. This is certainly not. And I know Angela is coming from the same place I am. We all are. It's not a criticism of the way caregivers, you know, maybe handling a situation. We're here to help Angela and I do you know, classes, we do free webinars, free Zoom back and forth with people. We're here to help. It's, it's absolutely not, you know, any sort of uh, a criticism or whatever. It's just we kind of get stuck in these stigmas and these stereotypes. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, to do the procedures, there is a there isn't a list of 10 things that you should do. Um, so it's like the lady at the beginning of COVID, um, I had a neighbor um, whose wife had been diagnosed a couple of years. And he's one of those gentlemen that knows she's not going to a nursing home, going to keep it. Home. And I said, well, you definitely need some help at times because it was awkward at shower time. Uh, that didn't work. And then just through talking with him and listening to her, she loved the housekeeper who came in five days a week. She loved her. And I said, well, can you kind of pivot the role? And she cleans for three days and the other two, she's with your wife. So he said, why didn't I think of that? I said, because you've kind of bogged down and you're stressed and you're worrying and you thought, can't think clearly. But um, he then started to, because uh, he got attached to me, obviously, and my husband volunteered me. He started dropping her off on our back patio where I was trying to grow in the first time in my life, tomatoes and zucchini I nearly said courgettes we call them courgettes in England zucchini and she came over and she was just transformed because she could see I needed help and this was something she was good at and one day it was fun and he said I hope you don't mind me saying this he said but she said she's kind of needy she needs my help oh <laughs> I said that is perfect that's what we were but it gave him a little bit of respite and it wasn't rocket science was it it wasn't a pill um it was just normal everyday living. Absolutely. And that can happen in, in a, uh, you know, a memory enhancement um, type community as well. You know, I think uh, a lot of the newer ones and certainly some of the smaller, um, more conscientious type group homes are shifting to this um, Cameron Camp model of, you know, habilitative um dementia care if you search out whatever search engine you use or uh, youtube search um activities dementia australia you will absolutely be blown away they shop for their own food they grow their own food they cook their own food <laughs> they clean up and again you know cam makes that point that the care aids are there they're just not hovering so that habilitative dementia care basically is can you still do this? Well, have at it, you know, and, and again, yes, we need to, we do have a responsibility to make sure that they're safe. Um, why do we have to change? Why do we have to step into their world? Because we're not the one with cognitive challenges. So and the message is that you've, it's definitely loud and clear. You're saying, can you do this? And also, as you said before, don't presume they can't, because mm -hmm. that's where they get stuck. Um, yeah. Cameron Camp's so useful because he's yeah. stopping, you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So again, thank you, Tipa Snow, for these words that I will always make sure I give her props for it because I cannot not use them. They, they just hit the nail right on the head. You don't crave a donut for the hole in the middle. You crave a donut because of the delicious cake around it. So habilitative dementia care is 
uh, you know, the hole is there, not much we can do about it, but don't throw away all that, that yummy, you know, cake and frosting and cause it's still good, you know, and, and it's still something to enjoy. And that is true. Opportunities to, um, and I'm not, we're not really, I'm not going in a different direction, but I think we always have to be open-minded. I think of a lady whose husband, Jack, was a Korean war veteran and he was a wonderful painter. And one day she shared with me of landscape. She said he never painted till he officially had the diagnosis. It coincided with that. So your brain copes and compensates. And he wasn't just painting and splashing around or coloring. It was they were beautiful, beautiful. Mm-hmm. So it saved him and it relieved her. But so your brain um, has reserves. And, you know, sometimes we may have a certain area of the brain might be responsible for inhibition. Someone who says, oh, I can't paint. And in a backhanded way, one of the, if there are positives to that disease process, the disease process might affect that area of the brain and and release some of those inhibitions. So, you know, it's never too late to try anything. That is a really good point because we know, and I've seen this myself, and this is one of the things somebody taught me, and I'm thinking I haven't noticed that. And now I realize people, um, we're all intuitive. I think that's heightened too. Like this neighbor, man, she definitely warmed to me. She knew I was going to be useful to her for some reason. So their intuition, I think, is um, heightened if we just give people a chance. You know, and that's in addition to the four lobes, there's kind of two bosses in the brain, your primal brain, that's your emotions and keeping the body alive, um, fight or flight reactions. And then, you know, up here in the temporal lobe, we've got the executive brain. And I always say, think of the primal brain as, you know, years ago when you bought a computer, it had enough hardware so you could plug in, you just have to plug them in and turn it on. And that would be kind of your primal brain. And then we would add software to it, developing, you know, building up the computer. That's your executive brain. We're not born with the functions of decision making and reasoning and social filters. They develop over time. And as the disease processes progress, they start to wane a little bit. You start losing the, that executive function of the brain. So that primal brain starts to, it doesn't actually ever shut off. It's just more kind of like a dimmer switch. As the function of the executive brain starts to succumb to the disease process, that primal brain starts saying, okay, um, maybe I can't do this, but the emotions and not just in a bad way, you know, smells and, and the sounds of kids at the park. And, <laughs> you know, Jen, you always say, and I, I've heard you many times on your podcast and it stuck with me because I'd love to sit in the park and watch kids, but you always said your mom loved watching little kids, mm-hmm. you know, and I wonder if that's, i um, not a neurologist, I'm not going to diagnose, but I wonder <laughs> if that was, you know, more of her primal um, emotional brain going back to times when maybe you were kids and you and your little friends were, you know, playing in the backyard. So yeah, it's, um, there's a lot to draw on there. That's what I always assumed with her is that she was a mom and a grandma. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had tried all of the simplify the things they love to do advice. That Mm -hmm. was an epic failure. I think part of it was because I was trying too hard. So it was more of a performance because she was always saying, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to do it wrong. Like, mom, you can't do art wrong. Don't worry about it. It's very simple. Look, look, I screwed this up, but then you can, you know, erase it with this little bit of isopropyl alcohol. And, you know, don't, it's just, I'm like, just close your eyes and have fun. That's all we're here to do. And just, I think I was trying so hard that I, it made it not work. But you, (laughs) you said something about how, like their inhibitions, you know, they, they change. I'm wondering if I should have tried other things with her that weren't her like norm for, for mm-hmm. I can't think of what that might I'm be. But. Yeah. But Angela, um, I know you do a lot of great work and, and um, seminars and so forth um, on um, brain health. And you gave us an example before we went live here about 
um, sensory stimulation with the chocolate. And I, I think lots of people should hear about that if you don't mind repeating it. I don't. And I did share that with you both. And it ties in with what Jen just said, because, and it was quite impromptu. Um, one of the, it was a senior center and a few of the participants said, oh, can I, is it okay if I bring my husband or whoever it was, they have dementia. And of course, who am I to say no? I'm thinking, absolutely. So we weren't going to do anything like crossword puzzles or jigsaws or trivia that day. It was going to be about the senses. So I kind of skipped on the education part of it and listing lavender and sage and what they do. I got rid of that, but I gave them materials. So we had mandarin oranges. Um, everybody's sniffing with them. And this man in the back said, this wakes you up. The citrus wakes you up. This is a good idea. So there you go. Then the best part that was very heartwarming um, was they handed out chocolate. So um, we had music playing and they unwrapped the chocolate. And we had Russell Stover, sugar free for those that wanted it, filled with coconut. And then we had the dove chocolate, the milk chocolate. So you had to unwrap it. And then place it on your tongue and close your eyes and really taste it. Um, and then whenever you want, you can crunch it, do whatever you wish, but just savor that chocolate. Well, there were so many. I looked at all the faces. Everybody was just in heaven with this chocolate. And um, everybody was equal in the room and lots of ums and ahs. And the first person who spoke, she said, you know, that's interesting. Um, I'm satisfied. That was enough. I really appreciated that piece of chocolate, where it's from. She was the lady with dementia. So her daughter is nearly falling off the chair. I said, well, there you go. That's what you've got to do. Don't be thinking you have to fix her or teach her anything because she was one of those daughters who was trying to make her mother remember and fill her up again with the knowledge she'd lost. So no, you've got to live for today and future. But I just thought that was so nice because um, she lost her inhibition. She was confident in leading the feedback on this chocolate. So we have to do more of that for sure. Okay, between and donuts and chocolate, it's like everybody's <laughs> going to be hungry after listening to this episode. Well, you know what, Jen? That, those are paybacks to you because I see your foodie posts on LinkedIn <laughs> with complete with pictures. You know, and, and five minutes before, I was looking at that can of tuna fish thinking that looked pretty good. And then I come upon these pictures from your kitchen. So, yeah, back at you, girlfriend. <laughs> Look for those. <laughs> well, I post those because I have curated a ridiculous amount of healthy, mostly quick making or slow cooker recipes. And then I've gone through my ridiculous it's probably six or eight inches tall of recipes and i took out anything that might be unsafe for somebody like my mom in the advanced stages like mm -hmm. things that have you know shredded nuts or not shredded nuts but slivered nuts on top or something that could be a choking hazard because you know we all need a little boost uh you know we need ideas we need things that are healthy tasty quick that way we're not relying on takeout or delivery or garbage food because that's not good for our brain so that's that's my my other passion although since the start of the pandemic my husband took over making dinners and i have not been able to wrestle it back <laughs> and since our move he's gotten super organized i mean we're, we make a list of what we're going to make for dinner and the side dishes then he decided he was doing the same thing with lunches he made a bunch grilled a bunch of uh, now see we're just totally going to make people hungry <laughs> He grilled a bunch of chicken and a tri-tip to have for sandwiches or to throw on top of a salad or to just like, just have something different. Cause I was getting, yeah. I'm, I'm like, if I could just take a pill and be full with, and new, you know, not, you know, my nutrients mm. received for lunch, that'd be great. Cause I said, I am so bored with lunch and he was going out all the time. And he's like, I'm going out because I just want something different. So we've cured, I think we've cured that problem. That's a pretty new step that he's taken but you know it's it's been really interesting <laughs> but yeah that's why i post all those yeah between him doing the cooking and your clients <laughs> wanting to carry the boxes i think you got it going on there I girl i know and it's like okay what am i supposed to do i just sit around talk to people right. on the computer absolutely <laughs> so do you have any, uh, sorry you know sorry wendy mitchell the one i keep talking about she i just love her and 
And I've warned to her because she also has a Facebook page. So she puts lots of pictures of the Lake District in England. So she's my kind of conduit, you know, beautiful. She'll show the birds and red. So she's living her life just like this guy, Michael. But she somewhere, I don't know if it's in this book she's written, but somewhere she talked about she really realized, she anticipated she needed to change the kitchen. And I think she was one of those people who decided if I take the doors off the cabinets, tidy them up, I'm not going to get frustrated when I can't find anything. Now, of course, you could label the cabinets, the people do that, but she decided I'm just going to take certain cupboards. Um, so isn't that wonderful? She was planning and, and um, advising us all. She's saying, do this, try this. Um, but um, in our house in COVID, my husband's become the master chef. Well, on. it's interesting, you know, because some kitchens have, you know, the the latest style is the open shelving, which I am a super neat freak and very organized. And I don't think I'd want too many of those. But knowing that people, if you can't see it, you forget about it sometimes, especially mm-hmm. if you've got some sort of cognitive impairment. So that makes sense. I mean, I would hate to look at all the stuff in the cabinets, but if that kept, you know, my loved one from skipping meals and mm-hmm. it made mealtime easier because they could see it, that's actually not a bad idea. And I follow Wendy on Twitter, I believe it is. Oh, so you do and know I, what I do. I need so I keep thinking I should reach out to her and see if she'd like to be on the podcast because. Oh yeah, you must. Yeah, that would be great. And you know, it it is just a challenge because there's an eight hour difference between California and the UK. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Labeling is okay, but just keep in mind, they may lose, um, you know, the, it's not so much the eyes that go, but the processing in the occipital lobe. So but a plate, you know, if nothing more, probably your your muscle, your reflex memory tells you what to do with that for a long time in. So, yeah, and it may look goofy. It may look goofy as all get out, you know, to have a, a 18 by 20 poster of a toilet on your bathroom door. But, <laughs> you know, if it helps them to be, that's part of habilitative dementia care. It helps them to function. You know, think of a post-it note like you would a cane or a crutch. It's a mobility aid. That's the word crutch. It's a crutch. And with that, it brings you calm so you can think a little better and use mm-hmm. what you know, brain power you have. Uh, because stress is going to inhibit you living your life day, for all of us. Let's face yep. it. So I think that's where she's coming from. Um, it'd be great if you could invite, but maybe she can um, sleep in a little later. Or- <laughs> I did talk to a gentleman named Peter Berry. He's a cyclist and he and another gal wrote the book, Slow Puncture. Yeah. And she said, well, Peter's good before three o'clock. And I did the math backwards and went, "Ugh." <laughs> so you want me to talk to you before I'm actually up? So we, <laughs> we did negotiate an hour. I think it was 830 in the morning for me. And... You know, one one positive thing about podcasts is it doesn't really matter what you wear it on the bottom. So I put my <laughs> club cycle jersey on. I don't even remember what was on the bottom. And I, I looked nice, but when we were done, then I went and did my workout. So, yes. you know, it, it is manageable, but it's interesting that, you know, you mentioned stress, which I tell people stress is, you know, it's toxic to your brain. I would go nuts if I had posters of toilets on the doors and the cabinets off in the kitchen because that visual busyness stresses me out but then on the flip side of the coin it would make caregiving easier so I would have to figure out how to resolve those two issues so hopefully hopefully I don't have to deal with it again period it's resolved and it's calmer you'll soon adapt I would think you know I'm one of the few artists that I know that has a very, very clean mm. work, you know, studio workspace because I just can't deal with clutter. Makes me crazy. It actually stresses me out. So I would probably have to have cabinets that are open and then they'd have to be very beautiful. Cans would have to be. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little insight into my crazy. <laughs> so do you have any more um now the word is going to slip my mind. Activity suggestions that are sensory based, Angela. Um, the the music always. Um, in fact, that's what we're going to be doing next time. 
um, and we have a gentleman in the room. We've already shared which songs we each like. And one of the gentlemen is going to bring his ukulele at the next session. Now, let's see how that goes. So music always. And I avoid anything to do with arts and crafts because that can make people feel a little lacking if they're not quite as talented as the next one. And you probably appreciate that. But I do have a friend who does all those sip and paint things. I mean, and white grape juice and in nice glasses. So all of that. But I'm really working on um, the next time we're going to be sharing. Now that everybody's confident, we're going to be writing poems. So we're going to split in groups um, and finish each other's words and see what we come up with. So we'll I love a- that. Yeah. I so love that. What I do with that, because the visual helps, so I print off pictures and it can be um, some cute little kittens or babies, to what Donna said, you know, some babies in the park. Uh, it can be a beach and so on. Um, and then they just pick one that speaks to them and then they just get in their little groups, two or three, and come out with the words and then it's a poem. And so then you have this person who will read it out. Because Cameron Camp, again, reading mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. really, as long as you have the right font, on the page, reading round table, um, that's not lost. That ability is not lost at all. We, we assume too many deficits that aren't, aren't there. You know, we assume there's so much missing when really what's missing is our understanding of their capabilities a lot of times. You know, be surprised. Let them <laughs> have at it. Let them surprise you. I love what you do, Angela. Those are some really, really great ideas. And you know why I do it, Um, It's partly for me, too, because I'm like you, you know, you, we're in these um, eight hour days seminars um, with staff and we usually have good students occasionally, not so much. You know, there's a lot of work. It's relaxation. It's relaxation for me. So we were at the last one we talked about music. So I'm creating the playlist. And uh, one man was really, really warm to me because I said, I love that band. We love them in England, the Isley Brothers. And he started singing harvest for the world and all these and, and so he's like oh I connected with her so he's telling his wife and so there's all this this club that we have now just a nice so there's lots of chit chat and then we do do some um amateur meditation you know we dim the light and we close our eyes and we're deep breathing and so we start with that um but I think my favorite is the the tasting you know Definitely the tasting, because I saw them. They all have their eyes closed and they see the pleasure on their faces. That's mm-hmm. good, you know? Yeah. That's a perfect example of continuing positive when the executive brain is starting to go offline. You're bringing that, those primal, and, you know, I don't mean primal in a sense of you know, Tarzan, <laughs> Jane, those emotions and so forth. Um, you're, you're, you're finding their sweet spot, Angela, is what I guess I'm saying. And I so admire that. Well, because if you think of yourself as a child, you had favorite things. And I think of my two little grandsons, a three-year-old and nearly two-year-old. They sit down at the little plastic round table and the food that I'm giving them is different what they're getting at home. So they're all excited. And then I, put, I have those plates that have sections. So the banana, so they taste the banana. And then which is your favorite? So fast forward, there they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, these 80 year olds and 75 year olds just sucking on chocolate and getting really, really euphoric <laughs> for a few minutes. They just thought it was fun too. But I didn't have them doing anything silly. Um, I knew I had to organize things a little bit, um, but it was um, everybody was equal in the room, which I think is nice and soothing for the families actually. Mm -hmm. It gave them confidence with them. I've done a little bit of work and we had lots of grant money in this area in Charlotte Mecklenburg. Those animatronics, I never really understood them initially, but they've taken off and they they, uh, give so much pleasure to to many people. We have a UNC gerontology student who's um, doing the project all around. So I've connected her with a few people who received these little um, kittens and they're quite lifelike. So you have to be open to any idea, right? Mm-hmm. I think that was the hardest thing for me. Partly, I did not have to do, I did not have to take over mom's care until after my dad died. And she was very advanced at that point. He refused to let my sister and I help, which didn't help at all. 
because then we missed out on the like the exploratory period of her disease where we could have maybe like I could not connect with her with music because I couldn't find anything that she connected to. I finally had some success with music that I remembered her mom playing when I was a kid, but that was, that was, to me, it was a bust because she never seemed to care. She liked talk radio when I was a kid. So I probably should have played her podcast, but I was never, you know, she couldn't follow. And at the time there weren't a lot of really short ones. Now there's, a gazillion so it would have been a different story but one of the things that i'm seeing i'm seeing a convergence of knowledge and care and it's it's going to be interesting you know as i like to remind people my paternal grandmother lived to 103 which means you guys have put up with me for at least another 45 or so years well, that mm-hmm. only gets you to 100 so I'm, I'm i'm cutting myself a little short there but i'm excited to see like we've had a huge shift in knowledge and understanding just in the last few years Mm -hmm. and conversations like this are really helpful because I think it gives people ideas. And I, and when Angela was glitching there for a second, I was going to tell Donna, Angela and I talked earlier in the week and I told her that I had learned of a little uh, sensory experiment with chocolate is to close your eyes, to inhale the scent very deeply and swallow Mm -hmm. and you'd be surprised you can taste that chocolate and you may not actually want to eat it i learned that during my weight loss journey you know sometimes and it's really soothing like if you're stressed or you're aggravated and you just breathe in chocolate and swallow it it does something really interesting to your brain and your nervous system so i think I All the suggestions with the sensory stuff. And I've talked to a gal uh, at the end of 2021 about using essential oils, the orange oils for, you know, to stimulate the system in the morning and the lavender in the evening to calm things down. And I probably should try that on myself sometime. <laughs> I would definitely try that because um, I overlooked to tell you that. I think we may have had it in our separate conversation the very first time I met with them, that's what we did. We just had plain cream unscented, like a vino or something that maybe that I sent. It was suave, just plain and expensive cream. I took in the pots and they chose their own essential oil. There was so much excitement and so much jostling around and making sure. So some had lavender, some had cheer, and they were the good ones, the doTERRA, nice stuff. And it was nice because they got to take something home. And it was, can I make another one? I'd like to give this to my neighbor. So again, it was a social thing, not threatening. And the room smelled delicious. (laughs) The lavender was the most popular. Um, So that's important. Having said all that, I think of Flora, who I knew for a couple of years in a a memory care community. She would not sit down to do anything at all. She was the housekeeper. She'd been a housewife for years. She would be tidying up, helping the staff, wiping down the surfaces, folding the napkins, all of the housekeeping, and that was her lot. And then she'd go outside and water the plants. I mean, just a very busy lady, but 